and welcome to the Crate and Crowbar, episode 107. It's the 25th of August, it's a Tuesday, and I'm joined by... Tom Senior. Marsh Davis. And I'm Graham Smith. And we're going to talk about PC games. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. And we're going to start by talking about Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. And you don't often think about Metal Gear being a PC game. It feels like PC games have had to absorb... Uh, just a metric fuck ton of lore uh, <laughs> that this series has built up on consoles over many many years in a very short space of time, and there's going to have to be a period of like almost like mourning and kind of getting to grips with uh, the the endless twists mm. and kind of co-plot like the plots and the timelines and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's a, important to disregard the story stuff because I think MGS5 is going to be an amazing open world sim mm. based on everything this show so far, which is really exciting. And probably worth fighting through a load of nonsense to get to. I've like I the last Metal Gear Solid game I played was Metal Gear Solid on the mm. PlayStation One, and I think that was the last one that came to PC as well before Grand Zeroes. Mm. Um, and and so I don't really understand the plot at all. But playing Grand Zeroes in that at least it didn't matter. Mm. And when there were cutscenes, it was. I don't know, I feel like there's a kind of frame of mind you can get into where Kojima's stuff is just an entertaining nonsense. I think there is a character called Death Skull, and you're going to uh, basically a Guantanamo Bay analogue, and your main mission is to rescue two characters, one of whom may or may not have a bomb in her vagina. And the other of which is a, a child who has put uh, had bolts put through his ankles so he can't walk anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. But so, he can uh, play a Walkman um, <laughs> with a plug which appears to be over his heart, metaphorically, in some way. <laughs> yeah, it's a sort of semi-meaningful nonsense, I guess. Awful. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it is a great game, though, Grand Zeroes, and hopefully, uh, mechanically, the follow-up will be even better. It's interesting, because Grand Zeroes, I really enjoyed it. I like, a lot, I like a lot about it, but it feels lacking in tools in a way that MGS5 looks very rich in different ways to mess with AI and to mm. mess with environments. Uh, and it, it always felt like you could throw like a clip to distract a guard or something, but that was pretty much felt like the limit of the interactions you could have with guards. It was just a game about sneaking, very much like in the MGS1 mold, really, where you're in a uh, just literally a series of, of um, like cuboid structures and just walking around people. And that is, like, there's a lot I like about Friends Heroes, but it didn't feel as though it was... Very advanced as a simulation in the way that MGS5 mm-hmm. looks like it's going to be much more entertaining. It doesn't, like, Grand Series makes no effort whatsoever, aside from not explaining the plot at all or mm-hmm. any of its characters are. It doesn't explain any of the things you can do with it or how its stealth actually functions. And mm-hmm. so, like, there was a period of adjustment playing it for me where it was like, where does this sit in the spectrum between Far Cry 3's stealth, which is you know, all about empowerment and forgiveness and, like, the original thief's stealth, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, and it's somewhere in the middle there. Like, there's a bunch of stuff you can do with the AI that it's not clear whatsoever. I mean, for example, like, you can grab people from behind and hold your knife to their throat, and then you can question them to get secret information about the map or call, have them call out to their friends and stuff like that. Yeah. But you can then do things like, for example, uh, knock out a guard, stick some C4 to them, wake them up, make them and then just wait until they wander off back near their friends or have them call out to their friends and then when their friends get close, blow up the C4 in order to kill all of them at once. And there's there's these little ways in which you can use the systems that are there, mm. uh, but just none of them are explained. And yet, at the same time, there's a kind of underlying logic to them. Like, there's not very many stealth games other than the one that our friend made, in which you can actually hold people at gunpoint and they don't just immediately pull their guns up. But if you walk up to a guard and you have your gun drawn, then they will just put their hands up Mm -hmm. and then lie down on the ground and you can do what you want with them. And so there's like all these things that it's doing which just aren't clear at all. And And one of the things that's more obvious that I really love was the vehicle stuff, the fact that you can just get in the vehicles and drive around yeah. and people don't assume that you're hostile, like they don't look mm. through the wind, windscreen and see you and get mm. mad. Um, and so there's... I've gone back to it basically over the last two weeks because when it first came out I did the 
the main objective to to save Chico and Paz and exfiltrate them. But then after that, it unlocks a bunch of other missions in the same place. Mm. Um, and so I've gone back over the last two weeks doing those, and I've had a lot of fun experimenting it in different ways. And there's there's nothing like they've shown in the Phantom Pain trailers where you can ride a horse and make your horse poop, and then make a jeep <laughs> slide on the poop, and then you know. It's quite tie awesome. the jeep to a balloon and send it into space, steal it, and then it <laughs> yeah. goes to your mother base, and then you can call it in for future things. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the the thing you, they showed a video where you've got these companions as well, and being Metal Gear, your choice of companions is uh, a horse, mech, or woman, <laughs> and the woman is like a sniper who's like just wearing a bikini called Quiet, mm. but there seems to be like a load of kind of behaviour that she can do that you're probably going to have to discover so they showed a very short 21 second clip where uh, you're stuck behind uh, some cover and there's a helicopter shooting your position uh, quiet jumps off away from you into cover uh, around the side of the helicopter then as Snake you throw a grenade uh, through the air just not trying to hit the helicopter and she shoots the grenade so that it ricochets into the helicopter and blows it up. Mm. <laughs> and I've no idea what how you actually make that happen, <laughs> uh, or if it's a special, specific command, but I, I think there's just going to be a period of amazing discovery where people find all the little treats that Kojima and the, that development team has left into their, have kind of like built into their, those interactions. There's going to be so many jokes and so many kind of... There's, there's always been this kind of slapstick, very almost puerile kind of element to Metal Gear games where mm. you'll, you'll find a guy doing a piss and then, like... If you stand under the guy doing doing a piss, like you can call people about it, and you get individual chats about the fact that you're standing there near a man who's pissing, and like there's always this stuff built into Metal Gear games, and there's just just in an open world, there's a potential for that to be just so many secrets and so many exciting things to find. Yes, I did one of the missions in Ground Zeroes. You're it's kind of the worst mission, actually, because it's quite a linear thing. You're mm. on a helicopter, and you're just firing down on troops. There's no stealth involved. It's purely a linear route in this helicopter through the scene where you're trying to uh, provide cover for a man on the ground who's first running on foot and then driving a jeep trying to escape. Mm. Um, and at some point, you have to get off, and you have to save him and get him back onto your helicopter and fly away. And in the end of it... Uh, the guy, it turns out that the guy that you rescued is Hideo Kojima. No, yeah. They've modelled his face and stuff like that. And you know, the only, <clears throat> only line he says is, what took you so long? But then when you get back to the menu screen, he's sat there on the helicopter that forms the background <laughs> of the menu screen. And then if you go to the mission select screen, Kojima will occasionally turn around and flick the mission select screen to pick a random thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Weird. Yeah. The, uh, your uh, Ground Zero saves will carry across to MGS5. Oh, wow. Um, and a lot of the people you rescue uh, or, or extract from that camp will uh, be members of your mother base mm. in MGS5. So, so, for example, the second mission you unlock is a mission to take out two kind of war criminals who are on the base. Yeah. And what you can do instead is uh, knock them out and take them to a helicopter drop and just kidnap them. Oh wow. And there's a possibility that they will now end up in MGS5 as part of your huh. base, as part of oh, your, wow. the crew that you're managing in the next game. But they, you're told that they're total assholes. Yeah. One of them's called yeah. I, and the other one's called Finger, and because oh, that was yeah. the only thing they needed in war. <laughs> <laughs> an eye to spot their enemy, and a finger to pull the trigger. <laughs> or something like that. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I killed both those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's supposed to be, like, you're in, it's supposed to be in a very morally ambiguous position anyway because you're the leader of a an independent military group that has established its own base in international waters mm. and is also hiding a nuclear weapon under the base. <laughs> yeah, and uh, at the end, I mean, is it spoilerous to say what happened in the Ground Zero? I, I don't think anyone understands it entirely. The, anyway. the base gets destroyed <laughs> mm. at the end of Ground Zero. You think you're getting an inspection by, like, the UN or something like that, yeah. but actually it's it was a ruse all along. Um and your base gets destroyed, which I s- is is Phantom Pain. It's set. It's set like what ten years later because you've been in a coma all yeah. that time. Yeah, you've obviously, of course, been in a coma for at yeah. least a decade. And then so yeah, you, how did you get in the coma? I thought you escaped the base at the end of. Oh, who cares? You do. Has, has but explodes. Has explodes because although you oh, got one yeah. of the bombs out of yeah, her, she had another it. game yeah. in her. Dot dot dot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to play it, Marsh? Oh yeah, no, I'm definitely going to play it. I'm going to play it on the uh, 
uh, on the recommendation of Matthew Castle, who I think has similarly little time for any of the Kojima bullshit uh, mm. of previous games, and he said that it's at a bare minimum in, uh, in, hmm. in number five, Phantom right. Pain, and it's just fun all the way through. Amazing. That's great. What I want. Hmm. Yeah. Is that next week, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. September 1st. And at the same time on PC, even though that wasn't originally planned. Yeah, it shows some degree of confidence in the port. And, like, Ground Zeroes runs absolutely beautifully on, yeah, it on does. PC. So maybe that engine is just really well tuned. Hmm. What have you been playing at the moment, Marsh? I've been playing um, Duskers, which is fucking great, I think. It's on early access at the moment. Apparently it was an indie-funded game. Oh, right. Well, actually, it might have failed to get funding from the Indie Fund, with capitals Indie Fund. Mm. But I think one of the people from the Indie Fund then funded it. Oh, right. Anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, Who's it made by? Have they made anything before? It's made by Misfits Attic, who made a game I didn't really like very much called um, A Virus Called Tom. Oh, I've heard um, of that, yeah. Uh, I can't remember anything about it apart from the fact I didn't like it very much, but, <laughs> which is probably not the best critique. So maybe it's great and I'm an idiot. Anyway, um, Duskers is great, and it's uh, basically I think I described it on Twitter today as um, cool running, cool running meets uh, uh, some sort of roguelike game via the scanner from Alien. Um, hmm. So you kind of. The idea is that you're investigating a series of derelict hulks through space because the entire of human species has disappeared and you want to find out the reason why, so you're going through these different hulks. Um, but you don't go there personally. You're remotely controlling a number of up to five, four uh, drones who each have their own little skill sets. You can swap skills between them. Um, but it's presented to you entirely through uh, a top-down view uh, and you can only control one drone at a time manually with WASD if you're in that top-down view and it's presented to you through their the drone's own optical sensors so it's kind of fuzzy scuzzy kind of vision mode doesn't really give you a great sense of what's around you particularly um and it's quite close in so you can't really see a lot of the level and uh, occasionally your uh, your drone's optical sensors will just cut out and gutter and you'll have to switch over to the other vision mode which is like a a, a pulled back schematic of the entire level mm. based on the information that you know that's there so maybe you hack a computer or interface with the computer rather and um, it'll tell you that there are 12 rooms around you and it'll put them on the schematic but there'll be doors leading off that and you don't know where they go and some of the doors will be active some of them won't and you'll need to go to power points to power power certain doors with certain drones and that'll give you access to more bits of the level and then you've got to you kind of constantly juggle uh the way you move through these levels because um, once you've moved a drone away from the power socket that's powering then the doors don't activate mm. so you need to kind of work out where the next power socket is in order to kind of open up a chain of doors for you to get to your eventual goal which is just basically to scavenge fuel and resources and scrap and things like that so you can build more stuff for your drones and actually get to places in the galaxy that you're that you're going and Obviously, while you're doing this, you're picking up little bits of information about the demise of humanity. Um, and uh, I don't know if the, the... I assume that on a different playthrough, the actual reason for humanity's demise might change. Uh, a bit, a bit, it's a roguelike, so all this stuff is procedurally generated, and uh, as a lot of roguelikes are, it's quite hard, so you can die. Or, or rather, you can just get to a situation where you can do fuck all. Um, like, you just run out of fuel, and or, you know, you're... Your your exit off a ship of a derelict ship is just boned. Uh, like meteorites hit the room between you and the exit, and it's just gone. Uh, and uh, so you need to wait for death, or you can just hit reset, and it'll put you back in a similar sort of situation again with similarish resources at your disposal. Hmm. But you can import the story data from your previous game. So there's some kind of remote operation storyline which facilitates that. Like, uh, I think you're somehow kind of having your mind uploaded to uh, a spaceship which is remote from you, and then you're remote controlling the drones from that spaceship. Who, remote from you, then who are you? It's not if, clear. All, if all of humanity's vanished. It's not clear whether you are a, a remnant of humanity investigating this, or whether you're some kind of AI or what. Um, I don't really know. Okay. Uh, it's quite... Uh, the story is yet to be fully implemented, uh, but I don't, don't actually. I think the ambiguity of what, what your setup situation is probably intentional rather than mm. just missing content. But um, it's incredibly atmospheric. It's very, very slowly slow paced. Um, like I'll spend you know twenty minutes just dithering about in the same room, kind of planning what I'm doing, mm. um, which is not entirely a good idea because as you stay on ships, rather. 
uh, inconveniently and surprisingly, having been left alone in space for something like 300 years, they suddenly start getting bombarded by meteorites and having <laughs> leaks and stuff. Um, so there is a kind of time pressure on it, but um, at least for the first... I, don't know, I think I've played about seven hours of it now. At least for the first four hours, it's extremely slow-paced. Mm. And um, there's, there's a really... Uh, pleasant aesthetic to the way even though it looks very basic in screenshots and you think this is probably going to be an ugly stupid you know not not it's not going to convey any kind of feeling through that those graphics you know they're just going to be um inert uh, because they're so basic but actually it, it is very very successful it completely gets the the, the fantasy of uh, really kind of tensely remotely operating these drones. You, see, you know, you've seen it in films where bomb disposal experts mm. operate drones and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a tension there mm. looking through these kind of mm. poor sensors at the world around them and hoping, you know, that, that they get the kind of critical job done. And there's, you know, there's just a kind of, there's a nice, uh, you must, you probably recognize the, the, the uh, the soundboard of sound effects that it's pulling from as being, you know, heavily inspired by Alien, amongst other things. You know, the kind of the the big roomy drones of a, <laughs> of a, a giant aching ship just mechanically whirring in the background, the noise of vents uh, hissing out air, and there's all kind of the, the whirs and you know beeps of your drones and the kind of fuzzy static of the intercom, and it's it creates this it's just an awesome atmosphere, uh, and. Um, one of the main ways in which it ramps up the tension is that you don't never know what's on the other side of a door unless you've used your motion sensors and you know maybe your motion sensors have cocked out or you don't have any. Uh, they're a resource that you need to kind of replenish. Um, and so you begin to improvise a lot of interesting tactics about how you can uh, determine what's on the other side of a door and how to say st stay safe. So um, maybe you've run out of the motion sensor, which will allow you to detect motion in adjacent rooms. Um, but maybe you have like deployable sensors that will scan a single room and you can drop it somewhere. So you kind of you open like a, a, a door to an, a room to the room that you want to go in, but close off all the doors to that. And you go in there, you drop a sensor, and you move out again, mm. and then you close the doors between you and that room, and then you open the doors between that room and the other room, and yeah. then if anything mm. wanders in there, then maybe you can close the door, and then maybe you can open it and then activate a security turret in one of the other rooms mm. and try and lure it through and get it shot. Um, and it's weird how, like, uh, not being uh, prepared for any of the kind of strategies that you can d deploy, uh, how, uh, maybe I'm just stupid, and maybe for a, for a better player, all of this stuff would be obvious from the, from the get-go, but there's a real satisfaction in just kind of slowly growing your skill set and then working out ways in which you can use these things together which weren't necessarily obvious to me from the, from the, from the beginning. Mm. And uh, it just it makes kind of the gradual growth growth of your mastery is really interesting in that game. And of course, when you die, you get reset, and you have a whole different set of drones and a whole different set of skills that you can give to them. There's loads and loads of different skills in the game. They can all be combined in different ways. Um, yeah, good, good game. Like it. Let's have it. Let's have it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, I think you've got it. Yeah, it sounds like a better execution of. Um the idea that Dead Noughts tried to do, which we mm. talked about on the pod before, where you're in a submarine-like environment and you're controlling, you're giving orders to a squad of humans, in that case, in this case, who are on a different ship that has the similar kind of fuzzy distancing mm. stuff that um, this game does as well, but uh, has no, like no, really none of the tension, even though a lot of the sound design is really good and mm. has similar kind of aspects to it. The When an alien appears, it just appears as a symbol on a map, but not like it's like an icon it has it has no sense of menace to it or threat and your people get wiped out and there's no real sense that and it's just kind of frustrating mm. how does this get around it oh uh, well it actually the, the aliens are slightly disappointing in it because it, even though you go to this other view which is quite scuzzy with the optical sensors it doesn't it's not quite scuzzy enough to disguise the fact that they are quite low poly and not very well animated <laughs> uh, but you do usually only see them for a split second before they fuck you up so <laughs> <laughs> there is that they're a threat um, they are a threat. There's no re, I think there are, like, there's maybe one skill you can have which might deter them, but I don't think you can fight them ever, whereas in, mm. I think Dead Noughts was more kind of confrontational. You're supposed to, yeah. You, you, you arm your people, you, cho you choose who gets the guns right. and who doesn't. And uh, a big element of Dead Noughts, uh, is that there is a lot about the relationships between your 
mm. your crew, if people dislike each other or that, you know, as your authority in some way, they might just disobey your orders and stuff like that. Which is a really interesting idea that I've obviously explored more, but in this particular execution, it was just frustrating the way that oh, it played out. It's the um, so it's Zephaus Diaries. Yeah. I was going to say Zompaus Diaries. <laughs> That's <laughs> not quite right. Um, do, your, do your drones and duskers, do they fall in love? Do they hate each other? Is <laughs> one of them secretly a racist or a homophobe? They have different health pools. <laughs> uh, they have. They also have different um, bleeps when you activate them. When you select one, and it goes beep, 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 beep. And the other one goes beep, beep, beep. Which is great. <laughs> Tommy was my favourite. Little R2D2s. Yeah, he had a great, great uh, chirrup. <laughs> I'm only interested in the trade-off between that gradual sense of mastery that you gain from failure in mm. roguelikes and the occurrence of just like, things that fuck you. Like, for example, the asteroid strikes you described. Yeah, it is. That's the the problem the game currently has to negotiate. I think is exactly that. Like, mm. I don't think they've got the balance quite right. In a roguelike game, you'd expect circumstance to come up, which challenges you. But in this case, circumstance uh, can put you in unwinnable situations. Mm. Um, like uh, I was on a on a level where uh, you have to teleport in. You have to find somewhere where you can get a teleport in the first place. Then you can go to these levels, which allow you to teleport in. Um, but the teleports just die eventually, mm. and then there's no way off them. Uh, and like, um, there was a teleport that might have reactivated in the far side of that that Hulk, but uh, none of the power points that were available to me could open the doors between us. Mm. Uh, and I think that might just be a problem with the procedural generation. Like, that's probably not intended. Like, I imagine all levels are intended to be solvable. Uh, but at the moment, there's this, uh, you know, it gets to a point where the seeds of your destruction are sowed a long time before you can perceive them, mm. but are completely unavoidable. Mm. So you can spend an hour or maybe two hours in a level when you're just like, oh, I could never have done this level. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, uh, but that didn't, that didn't feel gratifying to me. Really. Mm. But with the random events, like asteroid attacks, I always think of those things in games as tests of your resource management. Like Splunky is the, mm because it's so distilled it's always a really good example of these mechanics but there are points in Splunky where you can just find yourself in a pit through through which there's no way out unless you've got ropes or bombs mm. and so you can just end up I don't have any ropes or bombs and I'm just down this hole that I can't get out of game over kind of mm. thing mm. Um, but it's a reflection of your management of ropes and bombs and your purchasing mm. decisions up until that point it also happens quite quickly as well right mm. whereas yeah you hit yeah. that point but the mistake that you made, or in your decision making, might have happened ten minutes beforehand. Right, yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of the time these games struggle sometimes in early access, where uh, they don't have all their items in them yet, for example. So yeah, sometimes it's, it's to do with the level generation and not being refined enough. But sometimes mm. it's that they've they're planning on adding unlock unlockable or purchasable items for your characters that they haven't added yet that would if you had that thing because I mean it's the thing in um in Rogue or NetHack or any of these games that you can just die to the most basic of enemies if you happen to get trapped next to mm -hmm. a rat and a thing that paralyzes you and you were stupid enough that you didn't buy a teleport scroll back yeah, in town yeah. when you first started kind of thing I think um, given the amount of time that Derek you spent on the level generation is blunky. He, he, I, I imagine he would consider that a failure if you got trapped down a big hole without any ropes or bombs. Mm. It feels like he spent a long time iterating on that to it's, get it's, rid of those instances. It's not a thing where you like enter a level and you're already at the bottom of the hole. Mm. You always start up the top, so you, but you can very easily put yourself in that position. Basically, you're mm. climbing down, not realizing that you're just climbing down in a pit or on the um, the slippy, slidey ice world. Oh, yeah. It's it's really possible because it's uh, floating platforms above an abyss. It's very oh, yeah. easy to get into a position where you're like, mm. I'm at the lowest plane and I can't jump to the next platform across because it's too far yeah. and I don't have the rope to get back up to go across, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but it always just felt like my my fault in that instance. Is it, you can look down in Splunky, that's a big thing. Like I often, mm. often think about the swindle and like <laughs> how that for me you don't fails. You have to buy looking down. Yeah, exactly, and... <laughs> A lot of the ways that this woman doesn't mitigate that stuff. And actually, I discovered a new word today called Sadocore, <laughs> which is apparently a description for games that just don't care if the player has a miserable time sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's just overall, it's supposed to be about the struggle, which I don't really buy into that much <laughs> because, um, mm. th like, there has to be a sense of learning or progression to it, mm. which um, I didn't get out of Sindel at all after the first few hours, but which I massively got out of Splunky. 
and a lot of it felt like I wasn't battling the foibles of the level generation situ- system in Splunky so much as just navigating interesting enemies and interesting placements of, placements of spike traps and just kind of physical challenges that actually kind of yeah. But I think for me, these games are always should come back to your own decision making. That's mm. what it's a test of. Mm. And Splunky has platforming elements, so sometimes it's your ability to execute your decision making, and that that's fine. But it never felt like I was killed by a trick of the level generation. It always felt like I was defeated by the decision I made two shops ago, mm. to not buy the big box of ropes, but to yeah. buy the cape instead, or something yeah. like that. That kind of thing. Have you seen this stuff recently to do with Darkest Dungeon? Something like corpses. Yeah, they added corpses to the game, and their community went nuts. <laughs> what do the corpses do, other than just lie there? Well, so they, they, they did a couple of updates to the game, one of which was called Corpse and Hounds, and the main addition of it is that enemies, when killed, become corpses that remain on the battlefield and provide a shield for all other enemies that are behind them. Because the way um, Darkest Dungeons combat works is that you have a party of, I think, maximum of four that Mm. form a queue, and your enemy similarly forms a queue. So if you want to target the guy at the back of that queue, you have to have a ranged character, whereas your, your melee tank can maybe only hit the guy that's in front. But what happens with that is that there are certain builds of adventurers for your team where you can just have maybe say, two tanks at the front and two healers at the back, and you just smash at the first guy until he dies, and then the, the stack, the queue, moves up one. So you're constantly bringing all the characters within range of your melee. And arguably, the developers wanted to stop that, and they wanted enemy teams to maintain their formation for longer. So their solution for that is that when you kill an enemy monster, they become a corpse, and that corpse... It sticks around for a few turns, that seems variable, or you can hit it to destroy it. Um, and until that happens, that provides shielding for the enemies that are behind it, and the enemies otherwise keep within formation, so they don't all move up and mm-hmm. come within range of your melee character. This was coupled with a bunch of other changes. For example, enemies have more armor, enemies are more likely to strike critical damage, they added heart attacks, so that if you're, cause it's, it's a game like Dead Knot where it's, it's all about the, the stresses and the trauma that you accrue as you go along mm. a little bit. Um, and so Darkest Dungeon, if you get too stressed, then you can have, your characters can have heart attacks and die. They've also made it more complicated in that there's now a distinction between temporary afflictions of like traumas and permanent afflictions. Um, the latter of which cost more if you want to get rid of them because you can, like, when you get back to town, you can send your guys out for beers and prostitutes in order to soothe what, soothe what ails them. Um, as in life. <laughs> um, but all of these things combined, and the corpses being the most obvious symptom of that, made the game more difficult and more grindy mm. and mm. Less, you know, I did no more interest in decision making necessarily, just made battles take longer. Mm. And for a system that doesn't quite make sense, like corpses appear as like ankle high little mm. icons that look like you could step over them, and then when you try and attack them, it's possible to miss them, you know, even though it's an inanimate object. And they have their own health pool, so they don't necessarily get destroyed in their first hit or anything like that. Although they'll destroy get destroyed yeah. on their own if you just leave them. It's just impede what just, would have happened anyway. Yeah. And you can kind of understand why the developers wanted to do it, but it doesn't seem like the greatest solution. And in any case, it led to this situation where over the last month, Darkest Dungeon, which was beloved as an early access game, mm. started getting a lot of negative Steam reviews. Huh. Um, and so in response to this, the developers have added an option where... You have checkboxes now. You can turn off corpses and you can turn off heart attacks. But they're stressing that with those things on is still what they consider to be the Mm. official version of the game. Um, Although it's not the game that a lot of people want to play. And so there's this debate, basically, of should Darkest Dungeon be Mm. this kind of punishing, maybe... Saddle core, is that what you called it? Sado core. Sado core, not saddle core. (laughs) Maybe that true as well. Um, But or Or whether it's you know, should be the 
jaunty game where you get good anecdotes out of it about that time that your guy got dead sad because he got scared by a ghost and you know like yeah. there's a balance there and maybe where the developers see it is different from where 50% of their community see it I just I always feel like there reaches a point where those games waste my time mm. and that's basically the core of it for me is, is that if if I'm getting killed unnecessarily or there are for example you're forced to go through a hundred iterations of a thing to get to the end of the level as in Swindle I just feel like it's wasting my time if it's fucking me in that way over a long, longer period and yeah that that infuriates me more and more I think the older I get <laughs> yeah. the less time on earth you have <laughs> yeah precisely yeah it's just I think Darkest Dungeon would probably make you feel like it was wasting your time then because it's mm. combat is quite simple and it's system for traumatizing your adventures is really interesting but there are so many different levels of it of like i can't remember what they're called but there's like curses and poisons and ailments and traumas and mm. you know like it was all these different things and in battle your guys are constantly declaring i feel like this i have this thing i feel like this and so like there's all these all these bits of information that you're getting communicated to you where you just have to click through, yep, 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 hit the attack button. And then, you know, and that's it. That's as far as your decision making actually gets. So it's maybe not leading to interesting decision making as much as it's producing interesting anecdotes that, you know, sound good to say, my dad, my guy got really sad. <laughs> but then, like there are, are games, <laughs> there are games like the Yorg that are just dedicated anecdote generators. Oh yeah, and they just they just give you the anecdotes straight away, right? <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, how do you want your anecdotes served up? Do you want them served up with a side of Sado <laughs> core, or do you want them served straight up in a way that it's not going to take you many many hours to extract them? Well, it's nice to have the uh, the anecdotes emerge at some kind of granular procedural level, right? That's mm. it's quite nice for them just to come out of the gameplay. Whereas, I know the York's great, but I mean, all of the kind of anecdotes from it are kind of pre-cooked and then yes. softened mm. together. I guess you don't have any birth, uh, authorship over them as well. Mm. It feels as though perhaps if you're managing this party, yeah. then you're generating those in some way, which is yeah. more satisfying. FTO still seems like mm. perhaps the best balance of mm. these things for me between tactical decision-making and producing mm. Star Trek-like anecdotes. And obviously there's the uh, pre-scripted stuff that you just encounter a planet with a crazy man on side and do you take him on board or not. Um, but the, the, uh, the chain of decisions you're making about flushing oxygen out of your tank to kill these guys and then daring escape and putting out the fire and all this sort of stuff is makes for good stories I think that, yeah. that feel cinematic but there are very few games that that do it mm. that do it that well and really what I'd love is you know if the 2 to have maybe a little bit of Darkest Dungeons thing like better character development mm. for your little Star Trek captain so mm. you can you know you know, you can all appropriately sad when he burns to death in the fire. <laughs> yeah, or just you know have have a, a an age, you know, and mm. getting pressure to become an admiral, but he doesn't want it because he just wants to go off and punch green women. Well, that was the promise of Master's Chalice, wasn't it? That they were trying mm, to, yeah. but they never really uh, made the characters that were produced consequential. In the end, you just kind of had to accept what you had anyway. You couldn't. Uh, yeah. mm. It doesn't sound as if XCOM 2 is really going more down that route. Like, I would quite oh, like yeah. it to be a little bit more mm. Sims-ish. I would like it if my soldiers fell in love and got married every mm. now and again. Yeah, they seem to have gone down the road of like, improved a lot of kind of character customization in terms of the way they look on a mm. surface level. But there does, doesn't seem to be any any deeper mechanics attached to their relationships. Um, even though in XCOM 1 they had, uh, in Enemy Unknown, they had panic that could spread through your squad, yeah. which is like the most basic example of that. But it felt as that feels like that's a rich, untapped kind of area, doesn't it? Where if, uh, like Fire Emblem, uh, which is yeah. one of the best examples of this, where you know, if you have characters that are in love in some way, they fight alongside each other, then they gain bonuses. And yeah. that's kind of dumb, but really satisfying at the same time to watch them just you know, fuck guys up because they're so good together. And yeah, if it make, gives, me, gives me nice tingles. I wonder if, um, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they're afraid of taking that control away from the players mm. a little bit because it feels like you know I would like the relationship stuff to be just a thing that happened if you just had two characters and they fought together a whole bunch mm. then after three missions then they should be dating and I would be perfectly happy with that <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe the, they think 
No, no, I, the players will get angry about that. Steve's not going out with Jen. <laughs> <laughs> you now ruining it's my story. Jeopardizing that fan fiction, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't have, I can't have RNG jeopardizing that fan fiction. <laughs> It's also quite a dice roll heavy game, and I wonder mm. if they they they're worried about upsetting the balance of it. Like, yeah, yeah. it's easy to disrupt this stuff. Uh, but yeah, I would love that. Like, it's, it feels like the perfect mod, doesn't it? Yeah, it's to mod that stuff in. Oh man, that would be great. <laughs> a little bit of dwarf fortress in your ex if mm. you want. Mm. A bit of grief. Speaking of none of these things whatsoever, <laughs> I've been playing Super Hot, hey. mm. which is Brillo. Hey. <laughs> Uh, and the, so the, everyone here has played the prototype that they released, the, the free one. Yeah. Because it was like originally produced for a seven day FPS jam. And if you've not played it, it's a game in which time moves when you do. So that's their tagline for it. And frankly, it's slightly inaccurate. <laughs> time moves extremely slowly, even when you don't, <laughs> is what the tagline should actually be. Um, but mainly, you're dropped into a situation, say, a man is exploding backwards, having just been killed, and there's a gun floating in midair that he seems to have just spilled. And there are three other men just standing around you with guns pointed at you. And so you have to grab the gun and kill those three men. But every time you move, time moves at a speed commensurate with the speed or distance of your movement, mm. rather. And so firing your gun causes time to move forward, the amount of time it takes for your gun to fire and the bullet to start to travel out from the barrel and, and so forth and so on. And that was the prototype, and I think it was like four levels or something like that, and presented with a lot of style and that the enemies were red and the the levels were extremely sparse, although that seemed to be just a side effect of the fact it was made in seven days, but it had these kind of like full text flashes of text that provided very little context for your actions, but just enough context for your actions, everything you needed to know. And of course, what became an internet meme, super hot, super hot, etc, etc. And the it was a Kickstarter project a year later, and now a year after that, they've sent out a beta build to testers and to some press. And it's impressive that it's more or less the same game. <laughs> And I was concerned that after playing the prototype, well, that was really cool, but where are they going to go with it? How do you turn this into a full game? And it turns out you just make more levels for it. Yeah. And it's just a really great it's game. Concept, yeah. And, you know, that does them a slight disservice in that everything that they've put into it seems to have gone on to the presentation. So those levels are still this kind of stark white, um, no texture on the walls or any objects or anything like that. But now it's that's an art style, basically, mm. whereas before it was just a side effect of the fact that they, they had no budget and no time. And the enemies are still red geometrical shapes, but when they get hit by bullets, they shatter as if they're made from glass, causing, you know, sparks to and splinters to spill over the ground and stuff like that. And they you know, ragdoll in spectacular ways, which look brilliant in slow motion. And then there are all these... Little bits of finesse or tactics to it that you kind of discover as you go through it. So, like, one of the things is that different types of movement wind forward time, forward time a different amount. And so it's about dishing out time in increments. And I find that, like, if you're playing with keyboard and mouse, you can only really step forward, uh, an amount so small, because if you press W, you will move forward uh, mm -hmm. a fixed distance. You can't, you, if you use the analog stick, a lot of people say they, they use, do movement with the analog stick and aiming with the mouse. Oh, wow. And right. that's actually how the developers right. recommend oh, really? that you play. That's which interesting. Is pretty interesting. But I don't do that because to, if you want to wind forward time a smaller amount than you can manage with the WASD keys, you can just turn your head and look around mm -hmm. because that causes time to cycle forward as right. well. And then weapons based on the type of weapon that you pick up, and the weapons are just gained by killing people and stealing their gun, um, seemed to progress time a different amount mm. themselves. So the time it takes for a handgun to fire a single bullet and then time to slow down again is shorter than the time it takes a machine gun, which will fire four bullets at once. And so you get into this kind of a kind of economy between space and time of can I jump over that table before that bullet 
hits me, mm-hmm. or will jump, trying to jump over that table, wind time forward far enough that the bullet will reach this point before I get over there. And similarly with the weapons. And then there's lots of little nice things in the UI. So for example, uh, reloading is depicted via the crosshair rotating. Mm. And so you can tell how close you are towards re- uh, having reloaded your gun after the last shot by how far towards um, straight your crosshair is. And then once it gets to that point, it kind of flashes a little bit. Oh, that's really cool. um, and whenever you kill someone in endless mode, and correct me, I can't remember if it happens in story mode, you get the full screen flash of how many people you've killed. I don't think that happens in the story mode. It happens in the endless mode, which is what I'm playing mostly now. Because the story mode does about... I don't know, 20, 12, yeah. 20, oh, okay, 20. Maybe, okay, maybe less. <laughs> <laughs> I originally thought 16, so let's go with that. What's we'll right, the okay. difference? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and they're really good, and there's like kind of a hotline Miami ish meta narrative thing going on, and they're great, and they're really nice levels and really nice set pieces and that kind of thing. But the endless mode is the thing I'm going back to and trying to improve mm. my score over and mm. over again. And because there's this full screen flash of how many people you've killed every time you kill a new person, it allows you to kill people without looking. <laughs> and so it's this thing, the cool thing of, you know, explosion going off but not looking at it. Oh, yeah. You will see a little sliver of a red arm coming around a corner mm-hmm. and you can't throw it at the red arm because the player, the, the enemy won't be there when your sword reaches him. And so you'll just pick a point in air in front of him and you'll press right mouse button to throw your sword and your sword will travel like a third of the distance towards that person. There are swords in the game, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> and then you will turn and look away and, you know, grab a gun and start dealing with whoever else is around because after you've killed, like, four people, there's always more than one person at a time. Mm. Um, and then you get the, the flash on screen of how many people you've killed as it ticks from 15 to 16 and you know that your sword hit <laughs> over there, but you're already, you've already turned around and ran past some columns and around the corner and stuff like that. And... By slowing time down in the way it does, it makes the first-person shooter about its constituent elements of aiming and shooting and moving, because it's about aiming, then shooting, then moving. And by doing that, allows you to do them with such a greater degree of precision that you feel cool in every action that you perform. You've been playing it as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you've said. Yeah. The, um, once you've completed uh, a level, it does a little replay of, of mm. your action, but oh, in, right. in normal speed, while saying super hot. At the top of it. <laughs> but actually, what's weird is that it doesn't look nearly as cool when played at normal speed. <laughs> no, I, I guess because all the animations have been um, cooked especially to be viewed in a slow-mo mode. And there's obviously some fiddling going on with the relative speeds of your movements versus the enemies. You're always faster than the enemies. Uh, even if it was being played at real time, you'd still yeah. be faster because you can, you know, an enemy will run up to you with a with a, a, a katana and be swinging it towards you. You can still punch them and then take the katana from them <laughs> uh, when they get up close. And I, I think that the thing you're saying about the different guns uh, is actually the the most fascinating thing about that game to me because obviously I'm quite used to different guns having different tactical property, properties in in first person shooters, but never really have I been aware of the extent to which uh, time plays a role. Obviously, you know a gun will take a longer time to reload than another one, like a slow-firing slow sniper rifle. Mm. But in this, you're thinking that, well, the machine gun is going to advance time for, for like five seconds, and that's really risky. That's a huge risk in this game, where you want to minimise the amount of time being advanced whatsoever. Mm. But at the same time, you do fill the air with bullets. And so you end up, like, only ever firing with a with machine gun, when you know that you can maybe take out a whole bunch of dudes mm. with it by spinning and... You know, you, you know, making sure that each one of your bullets ends up in a man, and uh, it's it's really it's it's, it's interesting tactical proposition because it's completely different from uh, how the handgun works or how the shotgun works, and the katana works differently. And uh, it's uh, it's great, and also it does loads of cool stuff with space as well. You know, I've always bang on about how games don't do enough to kind of uh, play with a notion of being able to tran- transition from one space and time to another. Mm. Uh, in the same way that books can align time and films can align space mm. and time, you know, you never thrust between physical experiences abruptly in games very often. I and mean, this does it all the time because the levels are so short and mm. then you're being pushed to another kind of little vignette and the kind of environments flicker and change and you're in a different space. 
Uh, and it does that. There's there's a cool, as you were saying, a cool meta narrative. But I don't know if it's going to have a kind of cerebral payoff or whether it's just mm. a bit kind of gimmicky and, and and glib. But it's it's fun and it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I love the the art it allows them to do with mm. the menus. So the oh, yeah. The menus are presented in a kind of um, command prompt or DOS style, although it's mouse controlled. And then there are little conversations with other characters as if you're like telnetting into other computers and uh, hacking servers and stuff like that. Just mm. just a little bit, but it's a really nice style to it. Well, it's, this, it's kind of, it plays with it because uh, uh, in order to have any response on this, you have to get into chat dialogues on this kind of telnet thing. But in order to respond, you just have to type. Keys. You can't type the same key again, so you can't just hammer a single key. You just type random keys, and it will type out this perfect English message for you, which is apparently a response. And then later, <laughs> your character is alarmed when you try and type something. It, it isn't what they <laughs> they, <laughs> they thought they were going to type, which is kind of several layers of I don't know what's going. On. It's good. Yeah, it's good. So uh, that the the Matrix started this, but just the fundamental beauty of trajectories of projectiles. Mm. Mm cutting the air up that so you get to observe it in has, great detail and super hot it has in, it, I mean it has lovely trails on the bullets but it has lovely sound effects when they whisk mm. past your ears as well which is a really hard thing to do I would imagine because the bullets aren't moving at full speed mm. so like like technically, would they even emit sound? I don't. I don't know how yeah, sound would. But I don't know that you would be able to. I, well, yeah. It's kind of meaningless, isn't it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um, <laughs> but it feels right, basically, the world that they've created for for all these things. I remember playing the original version, uh, like the kind of prototype release, and thinking it was kind of a narbacular drop level mm. idea, mm. core idea for a game, which is like. It seems like the kind of idea and the kind of team that Valve will just hire to do uh, a five-hour version of that with more resources, just because yeah. the core idea of like how that you get to manipulate space in that way that is so new and so fresh, just the sort of thing that comes out of uh, the seven-day FPS jam is one of the best. It's turned out some receiver yeah. and some really fucking good stuff. I love receiver. Um, I'm about that. Really mm. exciting. So I'm, so I'm really, really glad. I've not actually played the, the latest build, but I'm really glad that Superhot is kind of delivering yeah. well, it's a core promise. Peachy, I would say. Fantastic. Stabby peachy. <laughs> Stabby shooty peachy slow. <laughs> <laughs> What's your best score in endless mode? Oh, uh, I've not been playing it that much. I've only got 30. Is that good? That's good. Okay. On test 18? Mm, yes. Yeah, well, it's not the... Yeah, yeah. There's only two of them, isn't there? There's yeah. only two levels. Yeah, although I only got to 30, uh, because when you play the endless mode, the more kills you get, the more mods you unlock, which are just kind of like uh, mutators uh, to use the... Final tournament term, so you can have a big head mode, mm. or there's a mode where uh, it doesn't cost time to look around with your mouse. Um, and I, I've only got to 30 while using that, so um. <laughs> I don't think uh, I think that's kind of cheating. Really. <laughs> I haven't tried that mode yet. My best is 29 on just no modifiers, but I was playing around yesterday with. There are modifiers so that each gun only has one bullet in it, which includes the machine gun. Oh wow! Okay, and uh, a mod in which you can't pick up any weapons at all, mm. and so you're either stuck with um, just your fists, or there's one where you can still pick up objects or punch things. <laughs> I remember the prototype version broke once for me in that the time mechanic didn't work at all, so it just played out. It was just a real-time shooter <laughs> when I loaded into it, and it was almost impossible because all the enemies seemed to be 100% accurate mm. when they're actually shooting, and the only way that you could possibly deal with it, deal with that is actually be faster than a speeding bullet. All the, all the levels have a kind of cool gimmick to them as well. I, right. the, there are some that are uh, that would be spoilable if you did it, but I mean, there's uh, there's a there's a fun one in um, in this long corridor, which is presumably some kind of mu- museum, mm. um, and all these guys with katanas are running down this long corridor. You and you're, the, the the museum's just lined with paintings and kind of ornaments that you can just pick up and <laughs> nobble them with as they come towards you. And there's this I don't know. It's very humorous. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's kind of it's mm. not it's not slapstick. I don't know what the, there isn't really a word for it. Uh, hmm. There's a humor to the way those levels are constructed, which is somehow ironic. Like it's a, sort of like um, 
irony how, or how irony works in plays, but I'm not quite sure what you would call it. Mm. I do like that you can pick up a martini glass in a bar level mm. and, and use that to smash into someone's face, <laughs> or pick up the the balls on a snooker table and lob them mm. at people. There's, a, there's a, like some tactics as well. Like not all the enemies are the same, so I'm pretty sure that if you throw an object at a character wielding a sword, then the object won't hit, it will just smash in front of them as if they've like sliced it in half. There is no oh, yeah. animation for that, but I'm pretty sure they have an automatic defense there. I don't know if it's automatic, I think it's actually more subtle. Like you can smash weapons in people's hands if you mm. shoot them. And uh, yeah, obviously if they're shooting at you, the projectiles you're lobbing at them might smash me there as well, mm. which is really annoying. Yeah, but I think the sword characters always do it, basically. Oh, they really? always smash. Oh. I don't think there's any way to melee them unless you, you're swinging an object in your hand. If you just throw it at them, it mm. doesn't seem to connect. Okay. It's also because it's, it's because it's uh, not real time, it allows you to do that turn-based thing of choosing your targets, who you're going to target first, and it's not necessarily always the person who's in front of you. If you've got a sword guy running quite close to you, it doesn't necessarily matter as much as the machine gun guy who's further away but has a machine gun and that feels really nice as well mm -hmm. deciding which order and which you're going to deal with these characters especially when in endless mode when you're sometimes surrounded by five people at once mm. huh. it's fucking great yeah <laughs> it's interesting that you mention humor there marsh in the, these levels because i've been playing good segue replaying portal 2 oh yeah, yeah. Um, which I, sometimes I just feel sad that Valve haven't released a game that I specifically want them to release, as in yeah. like not Dota. But mm. Obviously, that's a massive release for them. But uh, you Why know, don't they do what we want <laughs> instead of what Chris wants. <laughs> what well, Chris and many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other people yeah. definitely want. <laughs> but you know, um, a kind of a good, strong narrative, narrative Valve game, and that they got so good at like telling stories with the first person shooter mm. medium and. Uh, then they just stopped doing that and they, you know, seem to have just, uh, be working on it in the background for, for a while. But it was interesting to go back to Portal 2 because I think that Valve get away with so much by being funny. Hmm. And that sense of humour is almost, is a much bigger part of what's appealing about Valve than I ever gave the, what I ever really assumed before we playing Portal 2. Hmm. And I kind of think there's, there's, there are controversies that hit Valve that would stick with other de de other publishers for months and months and months. So, you know, the um, the mods thing with the Skyrim paid mods thing. If that was EA or Ubisoft, <laughs> there would be no like th that would they would be that would be on forums for years. And it feels like the internet's already forgotten about that <laughs> with Valve. There's a certain amount of leeway they have, and the fact that their their few public figures like Gabe Newell have this cult status because mm. I think it's because of their association with the orange box and the humour and the language that they've learned by doing the orange box and persisted with since the orange box throughout the development of Team Fortress 2 and with the release of Portal and with the Left Egg comics and with the Dota comics and all of the, yeah. and the, you know, the T TF2 shorts that they kind of learned with the orange box. Whereas they can't have known that Portal would have been the mimetic kind of explosion that it was mm. when it came out. That was a, the, just a, a charm bomb that no one was expecting. No one, no one wanted Portal. They didn't know <laughs> what it was. It was this weird tech demo, and it was attached to the real thing, which was Half Life, to Episode Two, and was it Episode One? No, it's Episode Two, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And suddenly there was Team Fortress Two, and it was it looked like a Pixar film, but it was also a shooter, and also it, there are comics, and they're hilarious. They're like funnier <laughs> than any other game developer. Like the writing yeah. is just funnier and better. And I, I honestly think that a lot of the, the Valve brand owes uh, owes a, a debt to the quality and the comedy of the writing in there. And it's interesting playing Portal Two because I, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like without the jokes and without Glados and without Weekly and the performances. And it's a fraction of the game, hmm. I think, without that stuff. And it, it's so long anyway that uh, it kind of doesn't have the, the portal thing of being able to get in and get out very quickly and just give you a satisfying arc with this uh, mind, mind bending portal device. It can't really do that anymore. So, what it does instead is that it just charms you completely by being incredibly funny and warm and witty hmm. uh, constantly. 
And I think this struck me, especially when I was playing through the first sequence where you first meet GLaDOS. GLaDOS is dead on the floor and Wheatley's there and, you know, uh, Wheatley's terrified. He's like, oh, thank God she's asleep. It's fine, it's fine. We're going to live, we're going to live. Just carry on, just carry on. And you carry on past it and then you fall down a hole and then you're led through a series of narrow corridors into uh, a tube full of switches and Whitley says, oh, this is, I'll just turn the power back on. It'll be fine. We'll get, this is the breaker area. Then he, he, he put, switches the, hits the wrong switch and you start ascending. And as you ascend, the platform you're ascending on flips all the switches from off to on. <laughs> therefore, <laughs> gradually powering up GLaDOS as you get to the top. And, uh, there's a bit where the platform falters and Whitley goes, oh, no, I've got it. Um, I've, I've figured out how to stop it. And then suddenly, like, the platform starts moving again even faster. It's like, <laughs> no, no, actually, that was the go faster part. And he just doesn't quite crack it. And then you get the moment where you, you, you reach the surface and it's a really fantastically framed because, you know, it puts you up just in the right point to see GLaDOS reassemble herself. And she's just, uh, she kind of rehooks herself onto the chassis and pulls herself up and, uh, she looks at you with a kind of single baleful HAL 2000 eye <laughs> and goes, it's you. <laughs> like that. Um, and actually, so moments later, she plucks you up with, uh, a big mechanical hand and it's the most unvalved thing because it forces your view upwards to see it mm. and the, the thing we always pray about and praise Val for is um, having this kind of uh, a sort of mastery of player psychology that they've gained through constant testing in, uh, of environments and they, they famously said about how, how hard it is to make players look up mm. so they've um, as you observed in your videos Marshall like they use birds flocking oh, yeah. upwards mm. to, to get you to kind of try and follow upwards to see events they want you to see but in this instance, it's important too. They just yank your view upwards. Yeah. And it's very, very unlike Valve. And actually, there's a lot about Portal 2 and the way it funnels you through environments that is very constraining and would infuriate me in other games. Like that sequence, if it wasn't so funny and so brilliantly framed and uh, Gala's dialogue wasn't so good, um, she, does, she has this great line, which is, we both said and did a lot of things that you're going to regret. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, it, I think it's uh, Pulse 2 is more about what good writing can do to rescue a game mm. than it is about the quality mm. of the puzzle game it actually is. It's still a perfectly fine puzzle game, but it's not a significant, it's not a sufficiently different puzzle game to the one that you experience in Portal 1. It's just that they're, they've leveraged their entire kind of all the best writers they have on the team and all the best kind of designers for the for the co-op robots and for the environments and mm. uh, and that's kind of is a it's a victory of like aesthetic over design weirdly for a Valve game which is so they're often so proud yeah. of being so well designed and I find it to be just a really interesting kind of reconfiguration of what I see Valve as being like and Valve games as being like. It's really interesting. Especially about the yanking your view yeah. up, because I have no recollection of that whatsoever. What I remember from the level design, or kind of set design in that game, was the way many of the levels construct themselves and mm. reconstruct themselves as you walk into them, and how that seemed to be a really good way of drawing your eye around an environment, mm. and a, a, a tool that Portal 1 never really had. Um, Another thing they use a lot is they have because uh, GLaDOS is clearing the, the crap out of these tubes, these suction tubes. They use debris flying those through those suction tubes a lot to kind of create motion. Oh, uh, so yeah. there'll be station, there'll be stationary debris in a, in a, a thing, a funnel, and then it will suddenly like shake and then blow upwards. And of course, you're going to watch it go up, and then that kind of leads you up to where you might have to shoot another portal. Gun. You kind of get a, a, an eye for what they what they do after a while, which is. Really, it doesn't make it any less skillful, but it is Yeah, I actually found Portal 2 slightly un unsatisfying in in that regard, partly because I think the puzzles were friendlier to the player than in Portal 1, mm. and a lot of the, the puzzle design in Portal 2 seemed to be about spotting the surface that you could put a portal on and then doing that, mm. uh, or at least in some of the kind of transitional levels anyway. Um, I think there were, there, there's a portion where you're basically... Your narrator changes as you go through Portal mm. 2. So it's not just GLaDOS um, narrating you. It's not just Weekly. There's a Cave Johnson section. And that's the section for me is where a lot of it is yeah. Cave Johnson monologuing while you look upwards through a huge environment to try and spot the single portal thing you need to do to get... Yeah, possibly uns you know unsatisfying in a puzzle sense, I think, but actually perfectly sensible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, sure, uh, sure. I enjoyed moving through those environments, and yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, uh, as you say, like the writing is what carries it. Yeah, and I, I love the game. It's just um, playing it again is reconfigured, mm. like it's changed my reasons for loving it. <laughs> for 
from you know I, I always thought I respected it as a puzzle game, which it is mm. a good puzzle game, but hmm, there's more to it than that. I played Tacoma mm. at Gamescom oh, a few right. weeks ago, and it's set on a space station. And one of the, the this is a game the, by the people who made Gone Home, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's basically gone home on a space station in that you're walking around empty environments trying to work out what's happened there by listening to audio logs and they've, they've got more money, money this time around and it's sci-fi and so some of those audio logs, um, act out 3D characters, but the 3D characters look like, uh, featureless colored Jellyman avatars, basically, and stuff like that. So, but it's basically gone home in space. But one of the things with the space station is that you can flick between the floor and the ceiling, like press a button to launch yourself up to fix yourself to the ceiling, mm. and then, you know, um, so this this space station is designed on basically two planes where there are doors up there that you can't get to. Mm. And the first time you encounter this is you just you you go into a lift and the way you travel between floors is just look at the ceiling and press the button and you launch up there. Um, but if you don't know that, it just looks like a lift and so you just walk in and the way they get around it is they just have a text prompt appear in big letters in the middle of the screen that says, look up. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the two people who were at Gamescom were two of the level designers on, on the game and they were just like, well, now you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then it's like there's a part of me which just feels like, yeah, I don't mind. Mm. I don't mind if you just want to write on screen the thing that I have to do. It's two words long. It didn't take me long to read it, and now I know that I need to look up in these situations in order to navigate. Like, yeah. I don't like, think there's anything wrong about being just upfront about the kind of interactions that are possible in your game, and sometimes you need to break the fourth wall to communicate that. But you actually preserve more of the fourth wall by just breaking it that one time <laughs> rather yeah. than having the player thinking, well, I don't know, can I, can I interact with this? Can I interact with that? Mm. There's a, a quite a good joke about that sort of prompt, actually, in the start of Portal 2. When oh, yes. you're, uh, That's my all-time favourite <laughs> joke. <in a laughs> really good joke. Uh, it's a really good joke. And, yeah, so you've uh, worked up after a long period of suspension and the facility's ruined, and uh, weekly this small robot comes up and wants to test your intellectual faculties, so asks you to say your name, I think, and then it says press space to say your name and then you press space which is the jump button and you jump and he goes <laughs> oh, what you did there was you jumped but I'm sure it's fine I'm sure there's, we can get over whatever lasting damage it does and it plays <laughs> a check on you like twice yeah. in the same space like <laughs> within about within a minute and it's extremely funny and it feels like they're taking the piss out of that kind of button prompt yeah. behaviour as well which is sort of a nice <laughs> nice touch it's very hard when playing Portal and Portal 2, not to see Aperture Science as a kind of self-deprecating take on Valve's own testing methodology in some way. <laughs> because uh, if you, when you see photographs of Valve's chop shops and the stuff they've used to make their augmented reality and, um, and virtual reality headsets and things, they, they love science and they love to test. <laughs> and it always feels like Aperture Science is a kind of... Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but like a, a very self-deprecating look at their own methodology in some way. <laughs> Have you played any of the co-op? Oh, yes, yeah. I played through it all twice. Oh, wow. Most mm-hmm. people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the co-op. I thought it was great. I bet they had a nightmare designing those arenas, but uh, they're really, really fun. Yeah, I think the co-op puzzles are much better than the single-player yeah. puzzles. Uh, there's a, an amazing one towards the end where <laughs> it forces you to catapult yourselves into each other to actually yeah. plonk into each other fall down onto a very narrow platform. And that's uh, just an amazing really funny thing to do with a friend it's just like <laughs> two robots fucking face planting into each other I keep on meaning to install uh, that mod which was uh, I forget the name of it testing with time machine or something like that but it was um, obviously yeah. you know time uh, play mechanics involved in Portal 2 yeah there's a, there's a, another one as well called Mel Story which is oh, yeah. to be really which actually has um, original voice acting from uh, J.K. Simmons I oh, think wow. who played uh, Cave, uh, Cave Johnson. How did yeah. they get the money to do that? <laughs> I don't know. And I think they had to ask Valve's permission and stuff to. Oh, wow. to yeah, it. Valve certainly helped them out and mm. on some level. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's it's. I, I played it and haven't been enjoying it that much. But oh. it's nice to hear new J.K. Simmons dialogue. Like, <laughs> okay, Johnson. Hmm. Hmm. Shall we do questions? Hmm. Questions. Yes. Hell yes. Hmm. Duncan writes in to say. Dear proprietors and patrons of the Creating Crowbar, which is a very literal and not especially punny introduction, but refreshing nonetheless. 
Uh, at the ACS TI5, there seemed to be several examples of high-profile Dota players and teams whose powers were waning. This, along with a recent shoulder injury I suffered that restricted my ability to game for a bit, has started me thinking about how a generation of players who've grown up playing games are going to feel when they slowly but surely lose the ability to play those games. In professional sports, players experience severe depression when they're forced to stop playing. Uh, he gives an example of this and uh, goes on a bit. And uh, then so he says, so do you, what do you think is going to happen basically when... Uh, when people get to that stage in their lives, do you think most people will just move on to a new game, a new genre? And what happens to those who can't make the transition? I mean, you can imagine you you can imagine sitting down with a the therapist and telling them that you are genuinely depressed because you can't play a video game anymore. Even typing that feels silly. Uh, and he also says, in a maybe related note, what chance of you guys setting up a hot dukes? <laughs> I see what you did there. Mm-hmm. Hot dukes, as in here is the storm chat channel. Uh, uh, for CNC listeners to find other people who hopefully only occasionally uh, suffer sexual and racial abuse. Um, <laughs> Duncan. Hmm. I don't think it's silly at all to feel depressed when you can't play a game anymore if that game was your career. I think it's perfectly natural mm. to become depressed if your entire life is about a thing, training for a thing, competing for a thing, and suddenly you can't do it. And I know... Um, Tom F. went to a tournament, this was years ago now, maybe seven years ago, before the, the recent eSports resurgence went to like a Counter-Strike tournament or something in France and spoke to players there, and they were talking about how you get to like 24 and your reflexes just aren't as good as they were when you were younger and stuff like that. Mm. And, and in those kinds of situations, there is no other game you can transition to, because whether it's clicks per minute in StarCraft or clicking on heads quick enough in Counter-Strike, there's just a certain physical limit and mm-hmm. you will degrade at those things. And I've never seen a community do such a great job at managing itself and and developing as my girlfriend's roller derby team mm. and how incredible they've been at fundraising and looking after it, because roller derby is like rugby where the person is a ball and you play it on roller skates on a track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so people break their legs mm. and maybe break their legs in three places. <laughs> Every and, time I've been to one of these <laughs> matches to spectate, there's always like three people who are in wheelchairs <laughs> observing <laughs> from the sidelines. Yeah. <laughs> They they weren't in wheelchairs until the last match, were they? Well, I think you were there for their mm. first bout in Bath, where yeah, blood was they had, they had, a, had the, the the rookie match before the the main event, and someone broke their ankle, and yeah, mm. that's why they always have St John's ambulance there waiting for these kinds of things. Mm. But that what what happens in those situations though is that people get injured, and they're out of the game for maybe three months, maybe longer, because they have to have often pins put in their legs and then physiotherapy. <laughs> therapy until they can walk again and they can't go to work and they become very isolated and those sorts of things um, and roller derby is super intense and it's you know 40 people you train with three times a week and there's a Facebook group and there's kit and there's there's fashion, there's a lifestyle, there's a this huge group of friends and then you can't do it anymore because you've broken your leg mm. and you're just reading about it on the internet about everyone training and going to these events and you're seeing photos and you can't be a part of it anymore. And so pretty quickly the roller derby team had to set up support groups for those people huh. um, in order to ha- help their with their mental health and make sure they were still included and find ways to still bring them along and have you know people whose role within the team is that's what they do as well as playing the sport. You might be the treasurer, you might be the... Um, the director or whatever, or you might be on the mental health support team that does this stuff. Mm. And it feels like internet communities are great at a lot of different things, but really shit at looking after people or creating safe spaces for people. And it feels like probably esports needs more of that kind of thing, because there are going to be a bunch of people coming out of these esports who gave their five, ten years to this thing, we're incredibly good at it, and then are just abandoned now and can't, mm-hmm. you know. And whether they fucked up their education or not, because they were playing Delta too much, whatever the case is, they probably don't have enough money in order to last them till they die, even if they were super successful. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, 
one of the reasons why footballers get paid so well is because, you know, if you're an American footballer, except, uh, 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 as in not soccer, but American football, yeah. you're going to come out with, first of all, a bunch of debilitating leg and arm injuries. Probably that, brain damage you know, of some kind. And, <laughs> yes, le- legitimately, probably brain damage yeah. of some form, um, for which there have been a great number of class action lawsuits recently against yeah. the NFL for exactly that reason. But, you know, you are... It's not an ex- excuse that doesn't let let off with the problems, but you're at least probably a millionaire by the time you retire, and that money means that you probably don't need to get another job unless yeah. you blow it all gambling because you're depressed, which a great many of them do, because there's still not enough support. It doesn't solve the void that you can uh, be left with. I mean, it's interesting to read about the depression of people who won Olympic medals, and just because they've reached the peak and it's just been... Mm. the entire purpose of their existence has been removed and then they have to find other things and there is no support if you're a, a win- if you've won something you're the like 38 don't support they've just won something they're just the best at, you know anyone in the world at that yeah. thing they won a gold medal in running at this particular distance and uh, yeah the, the total loneliness of that position and also the fact that they've achieved everything and feel incomplete somehow <laughs> is a, a, a dark psychological trap it's, I mean, it's uh, a lot of the Olympic sports are incredibly hard to make a living from anyway, because yeah. they tell you when you don't get any sponsorship. So you're entirely dependent on government grants or national lottery grants and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so there were a bunch of examples of, the, examples of this a few years ago, because the 2012 Olympics were coming up, and Britain didn't want to be embarrassed at its own Olympics, and so it poured a huge amount of money into lots of different sports, and then those people who'd trained and been supported by the government, won gold medals, and then literally a month after the Olympics were done, all funding was cut, and those teams just had to disband, and all those professional athletes who had trained over years and years to become exceptionally good at this thing, now just work in banks and in Tesco's and have, you know, it's just like, eh, that was it, mm. you were done now. That must be gutting. <laughs> that, that's, uh, this is, uh, you know, go, uh, draw it back to the question, there's a very different level of suffering from I can't get quite the same KD ratio in Counter Strike anymore because mm. I'm in my late twenties instead of my late, you know, teens. So I think yeah. Like, doesn't that depress yeah. you to some extent? I mean, it doesn't uh, do, it, I think the, it the is, fact like, that it's, that it's manifested through a game doesn't depress me. The fact that I'm dying <laughs> 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 the fact that there's a symptom of my gradual well, but I'm... inexorable slide towards the grave is is, is slightly Pressing, but I think it's, it's that you know no team will hire you anymore because mm-hmm. you're not as good as you used to be. So mm-hmm. this social circle that you had and this social status that you had that gave you self-esteem and self-respect and credibility mm-hmm. within the world and praise and fans and cheering and money and That's you just... live in a house with the, all the other people you train with and mm-hmm. no, 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 you're just... Is there a sense that, so the shooters are a pretty good, you know, twitch, twitch headshots, that kind of level of really super fast reading the situation and reacting and the stuff that a young brain will just be better at than my brain uh you know if, if, unless that's your entire life if that's just your hobby and you love counter strike and all your friends play, play counter strike does that decrepitude gradual decrepitude injure your social life if uh i don't think so really necessarily i think doesn't everyone just find a way to have fun together in, you mean outside of I'm talking the about professional hobbyist arena. stuff, yeah. I'm talking about just stuff. I think in terms of hobbyists, you're probably always all right. right. You know, yeah. like even right. if you are super into Counter-Strike and that's the only game you play, I mm. think you would always have access to that community. And I don't think if you're a hobbyist, then it's as much a part of your life mm. anyway. And if it all goes her- terribly wrong, then there's always everybody's gone to the rapture. Exactly. To save you from <laughs> having to do almost anything. <laughs> yep. Walking simulators. Yeah. Well, pro walking simulator player. For, for post-30, former <laughs> FPS crack shots. Yeah. Become the best at absorbing narrative through <laughs> audio diaries. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? I think it was Alex Wiltshire, who former guest of the pod, that said that he returned to Journey recently. Is that yeah. a terrible thing to to steal someone else's anecdote <laughs> but Return to Journey because it just got an HD re-release on PlayStation 4 yeah. and ha- there was a, a co-op player there who took him through the game and they had a great time and Alex has played it before but he had this wonderful experience and when he was done he went to that 
user's profile page and found out that they were like 70 years old and they were part of oh. this group of journey players and that this is what they do they mm. play journey every day and they take players through it and show it to them and make sure that they have a good experience oh that's, <laughs> that's the fantastic. nicest thing <laughs> i've ever heard <laughs> so yeah doesn't matter if your reflexes are gone there's it's always a community out there oh you. that's I love that's so nice JR writes in to uh, point out, uh, as this email uh, will hopefully be read out on the pod going out on the August 28th, I thought I would point out that August the 28th was the first thing someone intentionally said in the Creating Crowbar voice. August the 28th? <laughs> <laughs> um, he also does uh, ask a question as well, uh, which is that he's got a shiny new gaming rig now. Can uh, CNC name me some release for upcoming games that are easy on the eyes? But are nonetheless good after you finish going. Oh, <laughs> look at the prettiness! Hmm. Oh, sure. Well, I, I mean, the Witcher and obviously Metal Gear coming out next week. Yeah, it does look pretty can't, hard. Can't do better yeah, than those, really. Does look good. Um, um, Mad Max comes out the same day as Metal Gear. Oh yeah, it's September first. Uh, oh, I played it. I played it, and I enjoyed the oh, car okay. combat and the open world stuff. But it's Avalanche, and so it's very pretty. They do very pretty explosions, mm-hmm. and failing that, Just Cause Three is yeah. not far behind it. And Just Cause mm-hmm. Two, I don't think gets its due as far as how beautiful that game was. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like it's quite basic pleasures. Like there's not a great deal of finesse about it. It just has really bright beaches and really bright snowy mountains and really. Brilliant blue skies and blue oceans and sunsets mm. and just ah oh, so nice and just because three seems to be the same. Yeah. Any suggestions for the prettiest game currently out at the moment? Um, Still not Mirror, that has Mirror, been. Mirror's Edge. Mirror's, Mirror's Edge is always good. Push yeah. your rig because it's from two thousand six. Yeah. David writes, "Dear Ook and Ook, I've recently and rather belatedly begun reading Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels and have fallen in love with the idea of being embodied as luggage in a video game, running around, consuming all of my path, striking fear into people's hearts with a stare from my keyhole and joyfully munching on crisps. Which literary character, characters or piece of travel wear would you like to be incarnated as in a game? Thanks. Hopefully at least one of you will have read the Discworld novels so I don't just sound like a crazy person. I've read the Discworld novels. I have uh, quite, quite a decent answer to this, which is that you should be able to play as the handbag from the importance of being earnest. Um, and I think you could you could make a stealth game where you have to um, position yourself in the in the tactically superlative position in order for to produce babies that people would then like to adopt. Um, I don't know if that would. <laughs> How did handbag go about this? Well, obviously you'd be you'd be in some way. A sentient handbag with some kind of travelling capacity of your own, uh, as as the luggage does from Discworld, mm. uh, with little legs, and you just have to deposit yourself and, and spew out babies in the right location, next to I don't know people who've been recently bereaved or something, people who are emotionally susceptible to uh, adoption. That's a good answer. <laughs> that is a good answer. Yeah. Not sure I can beat that. No, I was going to. Uh... Uh, talk about the Ian and Banks culture novels, which I always bring up in podcasts, really. But um, it's an exciting world because there are lots of cool gadgets that are run by artificial intelligences. And in fact, all of the human society is run by AIs. And there are a couple of positions I'd like to occupy in a game about such a universe. And one is one of the minds that runs humanity because uh, they run humanity on a, basic, a very cold cost benefit analysis kind of uh, scenario analysis algorithm where they're happy to sacrifice a thousand lives over here if it potentially saves 50,000 over there and they have also have a hilarious sense of humour that is very 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 dark and very mathematical and it would be very funny to play as that in a kind of strategy turn based strategy maybe ongoing RTS game about sacrificing various sectors of humanity for, mm. for, for in jokes with other AIs which is the sort of thing that Ian Banks culture and novel that mind would do. Does the question specify books? Or does it... Literary. So, I, mm. Mm, no, no, I think you can go further. I think maybe I've talked about this on the pod before, but there is a book about the Vietnam War, which talks about the war through the lens of the things that were carried by its soldiers. 
So the things found in the backpacks of dead soldiers in Vietnam and are talking about the war and the time period in the context of what they would be carrying. So everything from rations to mementos from home and so forth. And I always quite like the idea of, say, a roguelike game or some sort of RPG in which you didn't control the adventurer on his journeys. You simply controlled what he carried with him. <laughs> and... As he would go off on adventures, he would come back with things, some of which might be rings of power that would give him boosts to his stats, but some of which might simply have sentimental value that would bolster him in the, the eyes of the hard times. And so you would just basically pack his bag and say what you were carrying with him, and then get the kind of adventure reports. Like, I quite like that in games. There are, there are a series of kind of management-y RPGs in which you just give your guys swords and kick them out and send them off for adventures and then you get the kind of battle report back. I quite like that, but I would love to do that in a more kind of sentimental way. Let's play as the Ring of Power in Lord of the Rings, actually, being as it basically picks and chooses its hosts. Oh, yeah. You mm. could move through the world and affect it by corrupting them individually. If you get bored of corrupting one king, just hop onto a hobbit. <laughs> how would that, how would you, how mechanically corruption manifest itself? You kind of be able to kind of move their their sliders of their personality up and down or something. Or... <laughs> yeah, probably only one direction. You're not going to make anyone <laughs> yeah. and more friendly or nice <laughs> or sociable, uh, you know, by latching onto Mr. Well, I don't know if you have a very specific objective. I could see it as being like a a, a Sims style simulation where characters have a large number of different kind of personality sliders, hmm. and maybe you have a very specific objective in that world, which would normally require direct control to achieve. But you kind of manipulate these sliders, so you kind of bit by bit maneuver people towards it. So you know you make make somebody extraordinarily randy when they're outside of uh, somewhere where they where there's there's uh, people of the their desired sex. Uh, so they go in there, and you immediately flip that slider back, and then make them hungry. And so they go into the kitchen or Move something like that, and then slowly kind of try and move them through environments by. Uh, making them obsess about strange, <laughs> giving them strange impulses. <laughs> and your ultimate aim is to obviously draw the world into darkness, which is the <laughs> yes. game of the Ring of Power. And you could do that by manipulating people's hunger and sexual desires. Mm. Maybe that would be, that, maybe that be, that be hilarious. Yeah, all contributing to the overall kind of just want and evil of the world. Yeah, nice. As we do in our real lives every day. Yeah. Scoo asks, best in-game explosions? Mad Max, actually, I think. Wow. Really lovely twirling cars as they fly through the air where the explosions are not like a, a single ball but seem to emit from separate parts of the car and seem to almost be caught by the wind as the car spirals through the awesome. air. Yeah. Supreme Commander, it's got very good, mm. uh, a, a good kind of power reactor chain reaction that destroys an entire base. Mm. That's, uh, that's good stuff. That's the good stuff. Yeah, I always had fun as, as in a piece of game, but for the, the recent Halos explosions, which always have kind of interesting tints to them, like fuchsia mm. explosions. Because it's science fiction, it's got to have it's got to be a slightly green explosion or a slightly oh, yeah. purple explosion. Exactly, that's that how you know. Out. Yeah, that's, that's you it. know it's in the future. <laughs> yeah, nothing explodes with kind of just normal fire. That's no. fucking twentieth century Your bullshit. Laser explosions. <laughs> exactly. in the and that's all the time for questions we have. Mm. If you'd like to send in, send us some questions of your own, you can do so by tweeting us to at Crate and Crowbar, by emailing us to questions at Crate and Crowbar dot com, by posting on our forum, Crate and Crowbar dot com slash forum, or by tweeting us individually. I am at Gonas, G O N N A S. I'm at PCD Ludo, which is LUDO. I'm at Marsh Davis, which is D E B I E S. Hmm. Actually, almost forgot how to spell my name. <laughs> There's a, we've also got Patreon. Yeah, right? you can back us on Patreon Maybe by like going it. to patreon.com slash Cretan Crowbar mm-hmm. if you like our podcast and wonder why we haven't yet improved the audio quality. <laughs> <laughs> it's Six coming. Down. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, everybody. everybody.